All right, uh, that, that's really nice, uh, Ram and Dr. Kokia, I appreciate that connection. More than that, I appreciate the fact that uh, you have a warm-up. Truly, any lecture should have that warm-up. And you gave me not only just warm-up now, but you gave me an idea that I will never speak again without warm-up. <laughs> Because what it does, any movement, action, in a unison with mind and body, it actually actuates the whole internal hormonal systems, and it makes you really be very attuned, very aware, and attentive for every word I speak. So that's a good thing about it. Now, I have a proposal I got you to you. I want you to examine it. If you like it, you pass it. And if you pass this proposal that I am going to speak, I'll take it to many thousands of others to plead for the same cause. The proposal is a giving, as you can see, oh, sorry, I don't see a slide there. This one, I'll get some help. Yes. Giving is a moral obligation. I'll explain to you what is giving. Of course, you all know you have given many, many times many things. Giving is giving money, giving time, giving the leadership like Ram does, leading your senior center, organizing, arranging classes, arranging lectures. And uh, giving could be anything. It could be a love, affection, hug, smile, helping, counseling, any type of giving. Anything that you do to honor a human, to make them feel good, to, do, to create some happiness in their lives. So what's an obligation? An obligation is that you need to feel morally obliged to do what we're supposed to do. Of course, most people give a lot to many others, and that's good. That's usually by choice, usually by wishful thinking, wanting to give, and you are giving anyway. But what I'm pleading today is to say that make that as an obligation. You may question why, and I'll present the data why we are obliged to do it. If I see further, it's only because I'm standing on the shoulders of others, giants. So that's something that you have to understand that uh, this gentleman, though we had discovered the gravity, we had actually laid down the principles of physics. It is British modesty, they thought that way, that if I see further, I mean, it's such a great man, he said, if I see any further, after I've seen any further. And not only that he said, just as that Mr. Ra mentioned to us, that he stands on the shoulders of everybody, and like that he said, my discoveries are based on the shoulders, standing on the shoulders of the giants. That means the people that he has inspired, people that he got the ideas from, the ideas that he has learned from everybody, from the books or teachers, etc. He considered them as the giants for his discovery. So it's the way it goes, most every giving goes that way. That we celebrate uh, some gentlemen or people, noble laureates at the top, but truly, there's always something built up underneath. Conditions, situations, ideas, they flow, they come together, and it projects an individual to a high level. No question about the fact that the individual has a great role to play, but the fact is that it's always something that's building to the momentum. So that's important thing to realize. I mean, that, that goes without saying, but I'm glad that he made the point. Are we ready to go for slides or next slide? I don't see any. It's, it's shown on a little monitor. The projector. Can you turn off the lights? Yeah. Can you turn off the lights? Oh. 
from but there. The okay, all right. Now you can see, um, number one idea that I want to bring to you is the fact that we all, our thoughts, are, uh, come from our roots from Africa, so our ancestors are in Africa, and we, our journey started about 70,000 years ago. I need some light. I just want to uh, point to the fact that, uh, as you can see, the Homo sapiens, the people like us, our species, were all huddled at the center of the equator, around the equator, because at that time, the globe was wrapped up in thick sheets of ice. Life was not possible elsewhere. Therefore, they huddled at the equator in Africa, and as the weather started improving, it, that's the time that uh, the, our ancestors started gradually spreading the rest of Africa, and then a group of uh, ancestors took a route towards the Red Sea, southern part, southern part of the Red Sea, and they crossed over to Yemen, and then they went along the coastal areas to India, from India to far, Southeast India, then to Australia, then to Pacific Islands. The other group of our ancestors moved from a little bit of a land track towards the northern part of the Africa and towards the Middle East and South Asia. And uh, from there on, they spread gradually to the uh, northern part of the Asia. So, uh, from, from northern part of the Asia, that group also migrated slowly about 20,000 years ago as the weather improved and yet the ice was sucking most of the ocean's water, uh, ocean, uh, atmospheric, uh, atmospheric moisture, the oceans sunk and that uh, uh, left a, a land bridge between Asia and uh, America, that's called land bridge. At that time they, they crossed over the America. When they went about 15,000 years ago to the uh, United States, actually in the whole of American continent, it only took about 1,000 years for them to migrate to the south tip of America. So the bottom line is that uh, it's a story about 70,000 years that took people from Africa to the rest of the world. People anywhere in the world right now, whatever the color may be, whatever the language they speak, however they look, whatever the features are, and they all have rooted, have, our roots are in our ancestors in Africa. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? I want to present the information is so much involved, involved with so much development. Okay. Oh, uh, okay. 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 Took place over the number of years to be where we are today, and this is a lot of story. But I want to compress it. Use your intellect, which you are. You are all intellectuals, so well educated, uh, a lot of wisdom. Please fill in with your own imagination a lot of details here. I ask your cooperation in that, so that we know. I want to bring it where we started in Africa at that time, as as gatherers and then up to the, today. So I want some slides to give you an idea. As you can see, the life started like gatherers, like even today, most of our ancestors, big apes, do that. They just uh, they pick up nuts, some berries, some fruits, leaves, and roots. They live. Actually, that life continued for nearly 30,000 years. It was a long haul. That's how they lived all those years. 
And only since then, gradually, when it came to the next, uh, next slide please. As you can see, the hunting, we, we talk famously about hunting, actually hunting was much later, later game. And it was not a big game, still even though hunting started, but it wasn't something that is commonly big time hunting. Actually, still people got most food from gathering only. And when they were gathering, people had to be in small groups, because if there's a big group, they were not, there's not enough land, around 100 acres or so, they are not able to feed themselves. They stayed as families first, some clans, some groups of 10, 15, 20 people. But once they gathered and the hunting started, the numbers increased because they could get more food and feed more people. So, next slide please. And of course, farming came, and this is a big revolution. And this has happened only 10,000 years ago. For the first 50,000 years, that's just either gatherers or hunters. And it's only about 10,000 years ago that farming has started. And just to let you know, before the farming, the most important revelation was finding the use of fire. I mean, that made a big difference. In, it's so big a revolution, finding fire, because they were able to uh, turn the night into day. They were able to use the caves. They were able to cook the food. Once, once you start cooking the food, Actually, food quantities have bulged like in big time because they were able to cook and eat and digest the foods that they never used before. So that was a major revolution. It's, it's, it's bigger than anything that we take as an internet. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm farming alone. Just to let you know, I was a farmer in my life, early life, and I, I then switched into uh, to become a physician. So I know what the farming is. Obviously, farming was the main uh, supply of food and bread for all of us for centuries, even today, of course. And uh, once the even farming, it took so many revolutions, uh, changes in the farm itself. This was the most latest form of farming, considering what it started. It was actually man pulled the plow while another man pressing it. Then it will change it to a cattle, one cattle pulling it. Then they have used two cattle. So because this history is long, I want to just keep moving. Next please, next please. I want to bring to the next major revolution is a scientific revolution. Science has brought age of reason. Science has discovered so many things. And uh, you can see Copernicus. They were trying to figure out what in the world the universe is about. And it was prevailing thought at the time, people used to think that the universe was revolving around the earth. But his findings revealed that indeed it is the sun around which we revolve. And it was a revolution, big revolution. And there's so many things involved in that concept. First thing is the man is challenging the nature. He's saying, well, I'll find out who you are. I'll tell everybody what is happening. If prior to that, it was on God or uh, divine powers. But once they started exposing, and, and you can see so many rivers, scientific developments have happened. I just want to slide, uh, just give you one slide of a sample of it. Next, please. I just want you to know scientific revolution has brought up a major change, major thought process, in a philosophical thinking and political thinking. This is John Locke, and as I said, I'm only symbolizing one person, but that's not one, but it's, it's a lot more involved. But what, did it, what happened at the time, the philosophically they found it that community interests, the state, or a social contract, that's what they wrote it, is so important, that it, it, equally important as individual rights, but the state prevails over the individual. Otherwise, community interests are greater, more important than the individual interests. While individual interests are also important, individual rights are important. So that type of philosophy, political philosophies have evolved, governments have formed. Next slide, please. I just want to let you know that uh, I wanted to put one slide for industrial revolution. 
Yeah, you all know how big an industrial revolution its impact is. I didn't have to say it so much, but it started in England uh, in a big way, in textile industry. And you can see that Ellie White, he first discovered cotton gin. This revolutionized whole labor, payments, production, and, and there it did stop. It stopped. It went on to steam engines and locomotives, and, and you know the rest of the story. Next, please. Now, of course, I've come to the modern world. I didn't have to say too much. We have uh, cell phones, computers, laptops, you know, videographs, and, and, and you name it. And so many things as what we see. I don't have to say too much about what the modern world is like. You all know you're living in it. Next, please. You can see it from there. The other screen. <clears throat> you can see it there. Well, this slide summarizes what exactly human progress is about until what had happened until now. So it's really, I just brought the summary of whatever I talked to you so far. That's about human progress. Uh, next slide, please. I just want to let you know that this is what I was talking about. Virtually anybody in this society always stands on somebody's shoulders. There are basic workers, uh, people work at the lower levels, they get less pay, but they may be farmers, industrial workers, uh, teachers, I mean, you name everything. There is an escalating level of social architecture, but remember, everybody is depending on somebody. It's not just you, because this is an important concept to understand. If there's, if there's not anybody, there's nobody. It's only it is united effort that keeps individuals safe and individuals uh, do what they want to do. No matter how big a person you may be, President of the United States or not, or a great scientist or not, it always you are standing on somebody's shoulders. And actually, famously, J.F. Kennedy said, you want the rich, you rich guys, don't forget that you're standing on the shoulders of the poor. If you not, do not care for them, you'll know they'll pull you down. Doesn't take much. Next slide, please. Yeah, and this is uh, Sir Isaac Newton, I went over on him, so we, we can skip that. Next slide, please. This is another concept I want to give you. Thomas Edison, we know that he lit the world, he brought the light into, I mean, it's it just a phenomenal change once we discovered the electric bulb. He made all night into day, and he was able to extend the working hours. I mean, so many things have happened, you all know, with the, with the invention of light bulb. But what did he say? Did he say that, oh, I did all myself, as I was talking to you? See what he said. He said that I am more of a sponge than an inventor. Of course, he's a great inventor. He was an entrepreneur. He's a businessman. But he said, it's not me. But he, remember, he says what he did. He said, some of the court is not there, but he said, I took the ideas from an impractical, long-haired, scientist, merged with the hard-headed <coughs> businessman who counts only dollars and cents, and I used that into my business model, as you can see it, giving commercial value to the brilliant but misdirected ideas of others. So it is in humbleness, he's accepting the fact that it's all the entire message that I want to make through all the discussion it's the community, it's the people, it's, the, it's everybody, no matter who discovers it, who finds it, it is an underlying scheme, an underlying theme that builds up the, uh, our society. So it's also saying that it's important to understand that society comes first and individual, come, individual comes next in the order of priorities. That's my understanding. Next, please. Well, here is a most important slide. It's uh, more or less my conception. 
And this is the only slide that you'll spend a little time, the rest of it will go through very fast. If your time is okay, Adam, is it okay? Yeah, we got plenty of time. Okay, good. All right, this is the slide I want you to think about, and because I really need your support on this slide. What it is CC, what is CC stands for? Is a collective consciousness. What is collective consciousness? It's about what each of you know, about your knowledge, about your wisdom. Everything that we discussed so far, everything that all the revolutions that we created in the world to get where we are today. It is the knowledge, it's the wisdom, it's the know-how, it's the technology, it's the math, it's the science, every idea that is available floating in our, in our globe. That is in the libraries, schools, teachers giving to students. So this knowledge, a common pool of knowledge that we're talking about, that's what I call collective consciousness or awareness. What is the importance of this? In my view, you might even call this as a God. If you, if, if, if you have a concept of God, you can say collective consciousness is a God, a form of God. Because that's how invasive, pervasive, everywhere it is. That's the only thing that drives the societies forward, discovering new things, improving better. I want you to know this collective, but who made this collective consciousness? It's all those people, countless millions and billions of people that they worked hard, they struggled through their lives, they invented new things, they help each other, and that's what the collective consciousness is. And I, I credit to that a lot of it to them. If I'm standing where I am, whatever I learned, I only associated everything that's available around me and played around the way I like it, and I enjoyed my life in that fashion, and I want to enjoy that way. And this is given by countless generations of people that passed, passed us. And interestingly, if you took the generational calculations for the people, it's only about uh, 3,000 generations ago. We're all, you know, about, that is 60,000 years ago, that is 3,000 generations. If you calculate each generation is 20 years, about 3,000 generations ago, we're all just very close cousins. It only took this many generations to separate us, everybody. And to that matter, Indians, are the second largest uh, population next to Africa. And a la second longest population that existed next to Africa because it seems like people went there first. And you can see wherever the people live long enough, they have a lot of diversity in the features. People look differently, more different, for, for a variety of reasons. But anyway, the point is that this uh, social uh, collective consciousness, the, the idea that I talked to you about, it circulates, educates people. When I come into this world, besides the fact my parents brought me in, but teachers taught me in, so everything that I grasp is from the collective consciousness that's available. And I, I recirculate through my children, through my genes, and also I recirculate by talking here teaching people, helping others. So that's where it is recirculates and that's our obligation. In that obligation, it becomes an issue, a point to really, it's an obligation, it's not just a choice, if you, if you think about morally. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, now I'm going to present to you last a uh, few points that why I think uh, giving is a moral obligation. And uh, as you can see, I already told you, I'm only giving you a summary of all the points that I already made, that uh, we all share same ancestors, and we say we're all cousins. We're cousins no matter where you are on the planet Earth. Eric Gardner was being killed by a police officer, just by choking, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. He's our cousin. Equally, the police officer who killed him is also is our cousin. The only difference is the skin color. And the color of the skin, just to let you know, is nothing but to do with sun. For example, if Eric Gardner 
and come from the tropical uh, equator where sun is high, his skin is black. The same Eric Gardner, after his cousins who moved to the north, where they lived in the cold and the glaciers, their skin became white. So whether the color is different, whether the features are different, it doesn't matter, we're all cousins. And see how you treat your own cousin. Even if your bad relationship issues are there, as long as you have the idea that he is your cousin, hopefully that will mend their way of thinking about other people. <coughs> Basically the point I'm trying to make is I, I will give enough time to ask questions. Any questions that you want. Actually, I am better dealing with the questions than lecturing. So, uh, it, it's just going to come soon to an end, but I would, I would like you to ask questions, okay? So, uh, what I am trying to tell you is this collective consciousness is actually the main basis to drive the social progress and that we all share, we all get benefit out of it. That's why we should continue like the previous generations worked hard and gave it to us. We do the same thing for future generations, your posterity. Next, please. What I was telling you just now, I made a point about social contract and uh, the national, natural rights. We made the point that uh, it's a community interest a priority or the state interest priority or individual interest in terms of overall survival. For example, if we don't have an agreement which we had had recently in Peru, Lima, about environmental uh, uh, management, there will be a day when Florida will go underwater. This, this is not an exaggeration. The oceans are rising, and the only way to do is to do together. Even though there is no political mandate, everybody has to agree, but people realize that if we don't do all together certain things, we are not on this planet Earth. There was a time when a close to extinction had occurred in human life 70,000 years ago. At that time, you know, people were dead, and it's only 10,000 people left. So, most important thing we have to realize is that uh, community of common interests are priority or self-interest. And also I'm saying that uh, interdependency is it's just the theme or dictum of life. That's everybody is dependent on everybody else, just as I made a point. For example, just take one example where we had uh, uh, twin towers were attacked in uh, year 20, 2001, 9-11-2001. Can you believe just two twin towers in one nation floor, the whole world went into recession, it's never recovered completely yet. It, it's real. I mean, you got to think about how it happens. It affects everybody. It affects the travel, it affects the airlines, it affects the air. Uh, gas prices, it affects the, somebody in Peru cooking some meal and wanting to serve to a, a foreign visitor like an American visitor is affected, she is affected, and their children are affected. So that's how interdependent the society is. And, and, yeah. and, and giving help, uh, also, why do we have to do it? That's the point. The point is that if we don't do, what is the consequence? The world will be divided, more wars, more uh, no peace, no harmony. If the society is not stable, who is going to be happy about it? So it is in our own interest and in mutual interest that you have to uh, do give and, uh, and and help the community. Well, I also said that giving back is uh, uh, our immortal ethic because we took it. You took anybody, so legally, uh, even otherwise, morally, uh, in any way you look at it, what we took, we need to give back to somebody, the way we can do it. So that concludes my presentation about uh, 
giving back. But I'll also show you one more slide. Next slide, please. Which is the last slide. Yeah. Giving back also benefits the giver. Do you all know about those things? How you are benefited about, uh, how it benefits you uh, when you are giving? First thing is you form a social society to look at the, the example here. If, if somebody wasn't willing to give, I won't mention any names, people are embarrassed about being mentioned about the names, but, but let me tell you, somebody is doing, everybody is giving to somebody, and that's how we are able to do it. And, and uh, if we didn't do it, there won't be any gathering, social gathering like this here. This building is donated by many people for the good of everybody, and for good of us, and, and the chairs, the food, an organization, everything is given. So it is building social circle. If you didn't have it, you won't meet there once a month. Also, giving less, there's also a study done uh, recently, a psychologist who is reported in the Wall Street Journal, uh, uh, Dr. Dunn. What she did, she gave a uh, certain amount of cash to the graduates on the campus, and she told them, for half of them, she said, spend on yourself. Buy a watch, a ring, whatever you want to do. And, and then the other half she told, you spend that money on others, not on you. There was no unequivocally it is proven that the people who spent on others were a lot happier and the happiness lasted longer than those who spent on them. When they spent on them, they forgot next day, but when they gave it to, there's so many ways it is rebounding back to them, calm, comments, appreciation, memories, and, and, and all that. So it is a, it's a, it's a big thing on, the, on that. And, and we all enjoy that. I mean, if any of you as you give, you know how you feel about it. I mean, people who would donate a big time, they walk with a big chest and smile in, in the crowd and recognize me. Look at me. I mean, this is what is called a glow, the glow, it's called a, a, a glow that they have, a shining glow that they have. Anytime when you do something, you really feel that way. That, that's what I'm saying, one, one glow. That, that's the sort of thing that you always feel when you give it to somebody. And also, giving is a social justice issue. If you believe in social justice, and I have some beliefs in my own, uh, ingrained in my childhood, Anything that uh, I will always support weaker sections, always support children, suffering, diseased, women, anything that is being suppressed, I support it. It's just ingrained in me since childhood. There's no way that I will back off from that. But that's my belief system. And likewise, you all have many belief systems. And it may be a social justice is your cause. And also, you want to make a difference in society, in the same blend of things that we're talking about. And also, of course, not the least, people get tax deduction. And this is also given uh, for the same reason, because the government wants to encourage people to give it to us. I have a lot of other uh, aspects that I could talk. The one comment I'll make, the last comment I'll make about before I take questions, I have a couple of friends, uh, when I talk conversations with them, they're very bitter about government taxes. They say, oh my God, I don't want to pay this, this is a wasting on bad people, I mean, there's so much tax and all that. I agree, I understand their frustration. But I tell them, tax is nothing but a mandated charity. You are mandated to give it to them. But it's going to, of course, uh, it's going to highways, byways, roadways, education, library, I mean, everything, for national parks, I mean, so many good things it does. But it, what it also does is equalizer. It's giving, uh, taking from a little more money from the rich, giving it to the poor, and uh, spreading on social security, Medicaid, Medicaid, uh, you know, food stamps, whatever. Uh, so many ways that they are trying to equalize the society so that there won't be too much black money. So if you think about that way, I feel less sore about paying taxes. I'll stop there and open to your Questions and also I'm going to ask you, did I make a case in favor of giving as a moral obligation or not? Can you raise the hands please? Yes. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I'll take this message to many others, countless others in many different ways.
Thank you very much. But I'll take some questions. Yeah, yeah, just one. Hold on, hold on. We cannot hear. I'll give you mic, please. So everybody can hear the question. You said the skin color depends on sun. How come the folks who lived, the white folks who lived in Africa for hundreds of years, are still white? <laughs> That's a good question and a learned question. I take this question positively. What I presented was one of the biological explanations that I have been reading about it. I, it is not that I can prove for sure that's the only theory that holds good. But it is uh, accepted that it is a they, they feel it is uh, some form of adaptation, and uh, that's a strong prevailing theory by biologists at this time. But I, I admit to you, I'm lost on that question. No, that, that essentially, that statement essentially deals with the tanning effect of sun. It has nothing to do with the skin color or genetics. Or let us take uh, your point is correct, but it doesn't still change the fact that we are cousins. <laughs> yeah. 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 Enjoyed your presentation. That was very really thought provoking, and uh, I think it, the it make a good case about the social responsibilities, taking a global historic perspective and bringing it to the modern times. So I extend my congratulations for that. Thank you. However, I have some concern and I wanted to talk to you about them. Uh, you mentioned about the interdependent society and of course John Locke's uh, social contract, etc. But now in the modern time, we are living in a era where education is now focusing more on uh, STEM, science, technology, engineering, medicine. But what concerns me the most, from my point of view, is that in an interdependent society, there has to be a base at the bottom of that. And that is with the independent development, development of human beings in terms of their moral, rational humanitarian habits because it is the positive habits on a repeated basis uh, lays the foundation of character and in life character is everything because character determines your attitude, your insight, your rational perspective and that thing should stand at the bottom then the individual being enters into the interdependent society and upon which, as you mentioned in the Isaac Newton's uh, statement, we all stand on the see father because we stand on the shoulders of the giants. And uh, so my point is, we are uh, entering into this new information age and the internet uh, connectivity is turning us into one robot mega mega mind, so to speak, organic mind. But there is a little uh, paradoxical situation. On one hand, we have a globalization is becoming a fact of life and we are entering into the compressed village, global village. However, we still lack the global consciousness. And if we can share some, if we can share some doubt, I mean, uh, answer to my question, it will be appreciated. But wonderful your presentation. So what's, what's the question? What's your, are you worried about the character of the people? That... Yeah. The, the point I'm trying to make is, yeah, the question is, uh, we are in this uh, age of robots and uh, artificial intelligent uh, beings. Do you think that our uh, social responsibilities may change because we are going to have a non-bio form of beings, maybe smarter than us? Then what would happen to our morality, our rational thinking, our humanity itself? Yeah. Thank you. The question is that everything changes in the world. 
nothing is standing. But I, my belief is at least as man is uh, as uh, head on his shoulders, it will be for better. Now, it doesn't mean the bad things don't happen, but the good things will prevail. You will always see it's a, society is duality, it's a polarity. There's never a straight line for good things. Bad things will prevail, but will, good things will prevail. So that's my, the character also changes. What we think is a character might be of a different perspective 200 years from now. So my, my own guess is that, let me put it very simply. Most Indian parents particularly, they think that the kids are not that smart. Oh, uh, they're not listening to them. They're not doing right. They're not doing this that. But quite honestly, my impression is, I tell virtually every parent, remember, your kids are smarter than you. This is very important to know. They might look like they're not, but they're thinking what's good for them. In this situation. So the character they will have. And uh, that's my hope. Thank you. I don't have a question, but I have a request to everybody sitting over here, whoever is talking and on socialize, please go out to those of us who are interested in these questions and answers and do so. Thank you very much. I think you should take your message to the world. Take it to Washington, take it to ISAs, take it to Middle East. I think they need to hear about it. If you look at the world atmosphere right now, your message is very important. Now question one. You talked about Ice Age and we have progressed from Ice Age to what we feel now, the change in the atmosphere and the Florida going underwater. Question is to the weather changes that we see now, this is a natural progression of the events. I know we are stimulating the process, but ultimately it would have happened. One question. Second question. Talking about social justice, distribution, redistribution of wealth to the people who don't have it. Question is, is there a negative in the, the part, on the part of the receivers when we give to them? Thank you. Yeah, I'll take your second question first. That makes it easy. I agree with you. The implication is that is the negative absolutely negative. You don't make a handouts. I don't believe in handouts because that makes them lazy. Most every social system that we have invented so far prevails make people lazy not to work, that's not what is uh, good, absolutely correct. But that said, that might need a, a reformation, but helping people is good, provided you can make them educate. It's just like one example I give you, if you can teach a man how to fish, is more important than just give him a fish every day. That's the concept that I'm sure that you're equivalent about, and that's what you're referring to. And I agree with you 100% on that. The first question was, is it the nature? Or is it the man who is creating these weather issues or what may happen in the future? First thing is, I do believe nature has the predominant saying what is happening by itself. You know that lands put together as Pansia and now separated as a, 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 I mean, it's over 150 million years. We don't know what's going to happen in the next 10 million years, 20 million years. It is true that we don't have any control on that. But what we have control, for what we know now we have control, on CO2 emissions and toxic pollutions, we do our damn best, but we won't guarantee that we won't be extinct one day. We don't guarantee that the earth will break into two pieces one day. But uh, yet, man's whole challenge is always, always, even at the deathbed, even dying, you want to do the best you can for yourself and to everybody. Next, please. Am I did I answer your questions? Is it? Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the comments you made. Absolutely correct. Anybody else have a question? Okay. 
Yes, you were talking about the emissions and everything, which are affecting our uh, atmosphere and the weather and everything. I was wondering, you see, that how many cars, how many aeroplanes every day fly, and how much emission the aeroplanes make, you see. And these days, previously I used to see flocks of birds. I don't see any flock of birds these days, and they have been affected. So this is the main root, you see, that we have caused. Sir, you made my point. That's the whole point. I didn't dwell on it, but that's the whole point. Actually, the worst culprit of the pollution and creation of CO2 emissions, number one is who? America. Number two, China. India is coming close. <laughs> right? Any, any more questions? Anybody else has? Uh, I think uh, I think we 